All right, so in this video, we're going to cover one of the most important events in the 20th century, definitely one of the most important events to happen during World War I, and this is the Russian Revolution. So the Russian Revolution is something that's going to drive world history throughout the 20th century, and we're going to do a quick recap of what happened during the Russian Revolution here. So we're going to cover... The Russian revolutions. There are actually three that we're going to cover quickly in this video. So the first one happens in 1905. So well before World War I starts, nine years before the war breaks out. And we're going to kind of gloss over this one in order to get to the ones that happened during World War I. So in 1905, we get a series of protests and worker strikes about factory conditions. and the lack of food. And these protests forced the Tsar, at the time Tsar Nicholas II, to agree to a constitution and to work with an elected legislature called the Duma. Now, this should sound familiar because this is more or less the same thing that happened during the initial stages of the French Revolution. Uh, King Louis XVI agreed to a constitution and to work with an elected legislature, just like the Tsar is doing here. Also, just like the Tsar, or just like Louis, just like Louis the Sixteenth, Nicholas hated this and undermined it whenever he could. And what this leads to is an ineffective and inefficient government. And that's the Russian government when we get into World War I. The other thing that needs to be said here is that unlike France, the Duma had a rival, unofficial parliament. So the Duma was for the rich people the liberals. This rival unofficial parliament is called the Soviet. The Soviet is for the poor people. So workers, farmers, and soldiers. 
So these three groups of people are going to be very important moving forward, and they are represented by the Soviet, which, remember, is an unofficial parliament, but they do have a lot of unofficial authority. The people listen to the Soviet. Okay, so that sets up the background for when we get into World War I. So after this, the Soviet is largely quiet, but the outbreak of World War I wakes the Soviet back up. So the Russian military during World War I was not very good. They had not learned their lesson from the Crimean War. And they hadn't really improved in the 60 years since the Crimean War. So when the war broke out, The Russian military loses almost every battle with the Germans. The Tsar Nicholas believes the army is losing because of a lack of morale. He's right, they do have a lack of morale, but it's not because of the reason he thinks. So he believes the army is losing because of a lack of morale, not because they have outdated technology and bad tactics, and they're facing a better opponent. That's actually what's causing the lack of morale. But he believes the army is losing because of a lack of morale, and so he decides to fix it. By personally leading the army. This doesn't fix anything. The soldiers hated Nicholas. And so when he shows up, it makes their morale drop even more. And that did nothing to fix the actual problems of outdated technology, bad tactics, and a superior opponent. So Nicholas showing up causes them to keep losing 
because it doesn't fix the problem. So now the army's losses are now Nicholas's losses. Now, while this is going on back home, in Russia, the Tsar's wife, the Tsarina, Alexandria, is running the government. And she's competent at it. The only problem is she's German. So much like how Louis XVI's wife was Austrian and the Austrians were France's biggest enemy, right now the person running the Russian government is German and the people think she's a spy or a traitor. And on top of that, None of the conditions from 1905 have improved. If anything, they've gotten worse since the war started. So when we put all of this together and we get into 1917, In March of 1917, the war losses, the dislike of Alexandria, and the poor living and working conditions. cause another huge wave of strikes and protests. And this time, the only thing that the people will will take, the only thing that, that will that will quiet these protests is if the czar resigns. And so on March 16th, 1917, the czar resigns and he and his family are put under house arrest. And just to finish off their story, in 1918, the czar and his family are executed by the Bolsheviks during the Civil War, but we'll get to that in just a second. So we're still in March 
of 1917. And to replace the czar, a temporary or provisional, and this is the word that was used, provisional government replaces the czar until new elections can be held. Now it's around this same time the Soviet reforms and it spoke for the poor people. So we've got the provisional government, which is basically just the Duma, and the Soviet reforms, and it speaks again for the poor people. In April of 1917, the Germans now smelling blood in the water, send Vladimir Lenin back to Russia. Lenin was exiled from Russia and living in Switzerland. And so the Germans sent him back to Russia to destabilize the Russian government even further. And Lenin does exactly that. When Lenin arrives in Russia, he issues what are now known as his April Theses. And the April Theses outline the Bolshevik political ideology. Generally speaking, the Bolshevik political ideology said that all power should go to the Soviets. The war should end. And that the provisional government only works for rich people. But to put it even simpler, Lenin's slogan was this, land, that was for the farmers, bread, that was for the workers, and most importantly, peace, 
that was for the soldiers. So if you remember up here that the Soviet was for the poor people, workers, farmers, soldiers. That is specifically who Lenin is talking to here. Land, bread, peace. This works remarkably well. And the people flock to Lenin's party. In November of 1917, the Soviet voted to overthrow the provisional government and with the support of the military took over the capital. So this happens on November the 7th, 1917. The next day, Lenin pulls Russia out of World War I. and gives all the land in Russia to the farmers and the factories to the workers. Now, Obviously, the war is still going on, and this action sparks two military actions against Lenin. The first is that Russia's former allies so the United States, Great Britain, and France invade Russia to get rid of Lenin. And they fail because the war ends before they can. The second is a much bigger problem for Lenin. The second is a civil war. Because despite Lenin's popularity, he was still a just one political party amongst lots of political parties. And so all of Lenin's political opponents
join forces to get rid of him. So this civil war is often, it's the Russian civil war, but it's also the Red Army, which was Lenin's army, versus the White Army. And that was all of Lenin's political opponents. So the civil war ends in Lenin's favor. For two reasons. One, most of the military loved Lenin because he pulled them out of World War I. So most of the regular soldiers were on Lenin's side. The other problem was that his opponents were hopelessly divided. The only thing that united them was that they hated Lenin. You had monarchists, you had people who wanted to bring back the czar, you had people who wanted to set up a republic, you had people who just personally didn't like Lenin and wanted to get rid of him. You had all of these different people pulling in different directions and no one could put aside their differences just to fight Lenin. And so eventually, Lenin outlasted them. And after the Civil War, the Civil War lasts until 1922, and that's when the Soviet Union is created. And this event is going to be one of the most important events for understanding what happens in the 20th century but we'll worry about that as we move further and further into the 20th century. So until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.